So let's get ready for the next speaker, who is Professor Stefan Zalberg from Sweden, who is a professor in political science. I'm not sure if you're going to you will speak English or Swedish. I um, I think I go for English since everyone else okay. spoke English. Okay. Well, good. Please. Thank you. And um, thanks for everyone coming here today to um, listen to my presentation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, two projects, or actually it's kind of, we see it like an overarching project that I'm working on for, for some years now. And we call it lingu Linguistic Explorations of Societies. And it is um, interdisciplinary research using language technology to assist comparative survey research. And um, we are people from a lot of different fields here. It's political science, it's computer science, and computational linguistics. And what we try to do in this project is to use the most recent developments in natural language processing and try to combine and complement uh, the traditional comparative survey-based research. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, two projects where the most recent one, studying opinions and public uh, populations in online text data, is just as me, relocated to the mid-Sweden University nowadays. And uh, people involved here from the social sciences, there's a bunch of different universities involved, and um, one besides the Mid-Sweden University is the uh, University of Gothenburg, and it's the University of Bergen, and it's uh, the Gesis Institute in Mannheim, and uh, Södertörn University and the University of Stockholm when it comes to the social sciences. And from the computer science side, we have uh, people from RISE, uh, and Swedish Institute of Computer Science in Stockholm, and. Uh, uh, the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. Uh, we're many people involved and we work with a lot of different things here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is one specific paper that I worked on for some time within this project, which is called uh, Lost in Translation, how differences in word intensity affects citizens' satisfaction with the working of democracy. And the reason why I want to talk about this paper is that I like it a lot, and the reason why I like it is because it's so simple, but important. And uh, the background for all this project and this idea, it's uh, research I've conducted during the years uh, where I've worked a lot with uh, support for democracy. What makes citizens satisfied with the way democracy works in the country? And um, satisfaction with democracy just as institutional trust very important uh, variables to deal with. With uh, satisfied and trusting citizens, you get more compliance with laws, regulations, whatever. You get uh, smoother functioning societies. Um, so this is where I've done a lot of research. And when you work with, with data like this, you also get a sense of the data that you're working on and what's going on. And in the diagram here, in the graph, we find uh, aggregate levels rescaled into 0 1, but um, the average uh, level of, of satisfaction with democracy across a bunch of countries. I have combined some data sources here, and what we see is there's a lot of variation to explain for a social scientist like me, of course. But if we look in the upper right corner, this is a distinct pattern you more or less always find, no matter what kind of data set you have, and that is Denmark. They always stand out when it comes to satisfaction with democracy or life satisfaction. They are more or less always significantly more satisfied than people in Sweden or Scandinavia, for instance. And if we look at an indicator like democracy and the democratic systems we have, it's so similar, so it shouldn't be a real difference here. So how can this be? Um, luckily for me, I was not the only one interested in this. So when I started to look around, I found a really inspiring study by two Danish uh, researchers in sociology, by Henrik Lolle and Jürgen Gull Andersen. They are in Aalborg University. And they have also noted this, and they thought perhaps this has something to do with translations. So 
Simply, what they did was they conducted a small experiment with uh, university students uh, being taught in English at the uh, Oldborough University. Uh, it's a more complicated, a bit more complicated, but you can think of it as we take the students, randomize them into two groups. One received the World Value Survey, survey the original non-translated English version. The other half get the trans translated Danish. And this is what they find. Uh, if you ask them about how satisfied they are with their life, 41% are very satisfied if uh, they receive the English questionnaire, but 52% are very satisfied if they have it in Danish. So, truly a language effect. Interestingly though, they also find that when you ask about happiness, like satisfaction and satisfied in Danish, that's translated to tilfreds. And if you speak with a Dane and ask them, they say that tilfreds is like, it's okay. My, you know? And if it's okay, you can live with a lot of stuff. And when it comes to happiness, it's translated into lycklig. And here we find the opposite results. 44% uh, if you receive it in English are very happy, but only 29% if you receive the translated question. I have uh, replicated this in Sweden. I run some experiments at the Laboratory of Opinion Research located at the University of Gothenburg. I basically replicated these Danes and what I found was that when satisfied is translated into nöjd as it is in Sweden, I find no differences at all between the language of administration. But I could find the very same numbers uh, when it came to happiness. And happiness, also in the Swedish survey, translated into lycklig. So it appears that there's something going on here. It's easier to be happy in English, both in Swedish uh, and, and Danish. <laughs> but um, for satisfaction, for instance, it doesn't really matter if you speak English or Swedish and you live in Sweden. But in Denmark, it do so. So how can we possibly study this if we want to do it more broadly in a country comparative setting? Running survey experiments is costly and uh, you cannot really, you know about what's going on, but how can we possibly correct for this in the survey? Because now we know that something is going on. Here I've been inspired by some work from um, the natural language processing and especially in a specific field uh, called uh, it's sentiment analysis. That is when you, when you look on, for instance, media data and you want to use an algorithm to, to trace how an actor, a party or a party leader or whatever, if they are spoken about in, in positive or negative terms. And uh, if you want to do this and you have a, and it's kind of a, you need to go for a super semi-wise kind of machine learning algorithm and you have to provide it with a lexicon that tells this algorithm which words are positive, which are negative. But how can you possibly automatize this and how can you grade these terms? Well, you could tell the algorithm, but ideally you would like the algorithm to learn by itself. And uh, in this field they have done um, experiments with the frequency of a term. And the idea comes from the linguistic literature about semantic bleaching. When a word or a term is used a lot in language, it, it gets um, desemanticized. It loses its uh, content, you know, in a way, and especially its intensity. Um, so what they've been working with is just to relative frequency. The more a word is used in language, the less intense it is. And there's some experiments verifying this. And what we have done, tried to do then is to, to apply this into the survey setting. And um, how we have done this is that we have collected a lot of online data, online text data, where we have separated between editorial media and social media data. These numbers are a bit old now. This is from the spring, but at spring we had about 16, almost 17 billion editorial media documents and uh, 15 billion social media documents. And we get more data uh, as we stand here right now. And this data we have not only separated between editorial and social media, we have also geocoded it so we know from which country it comes. So for many countries we have just one language, but uh, other countries we have to, up to two or three languages. 
like in the US, we have English and Spanish, for instance. In Finland, we have Finnish and Finnish Swedish. And with this data, we have within the project constructed an API, which looks like this, which we're going to, to make public this autumn, where you basically can select the, con uh, the language you're interested in, uh, the country you're interested in, and uh, the news source, editorial or social media. And then you can type in a target term that you're interested in. And what lies behind here is um, a word embedding algorithm called word to vec which once shows us semantically similar terms used in a similar language context as the word democracy in English from Nigeria in the news media in this case. And from the neighboring terms here we also get an idea of how democracy is spoken about and understood in this specific country language context. But we also get information about how frequent this term is in the data that we have. And that is what I have worked with in, in this paper, the frequency. Uh, actually, I've used frequency and uh, the similarity term, which we see here, that is the cosine angle, goes from zero to one, and the closer to one means that that term is, is used in a very, very warm, almost identical uh, contextual language, contextual setting as the term democracy. Um, if we continue to look for just frequency and we take the translated terms from the surveys and we start with the satisfactions, we go back now with the Danes and try to go broad with this. If we look for frequency here, we see that the Danish is in top. It's increasing uh, for reasons which I don't know, but besides that, it's kind of stable over time, how frequently terms are used. And we find that the Danish tilfreds is by far most frequently used while we find the English, Norwegian and Sweden in the bottom, which corresponds to what we could see in the survey experiments in, uh, in Sweden, for instance. There were no difference between satisfied and nöjd, but satisfied and tilfreds, a big difference. If we look for happy and the translated term for these languages, we find uh, English in top and Denmark, Norway, Sweden in bottom. So all this points towards that there's something interesting going on here and that relative frequency might tell us something about the intensity of a term. Um, of course, I've also run a survey experiment on this, randomization of respondents in a web survey, trying different translations of Nerd, Tilfreds, Tilfredstel, which would be a dictionary translation. And um, we find significant differences across the groups, depending on what translation we use. And we also find that this is perfectly linear with the relative frequency in the, our database. So, taking this into the survey research, here I am using a data set called Comparative Studies of Electoral Systems, which is uh, a database, it's a, it's a collection, it's a joint module in all election studies that are conducted around the world. So I take the original questionnaires, I take the term used for to translate the, the word satisfied, and I take this and calculate a frequency measure, add this back to the CSES data, and see what happens. What we see here is uh, the aggregated satisfaction with democracy for a country or a language. Um, Election studies are conducted and translated in different languages depending on how big uh, the minority groups are. Usually the, the rule of thumb is if you have a minority group larger than 5% of the population, you translate the survey into that term, which means that for some countries we have the same survey in different languages. But the pattern that we see here, it's a, not super strong, but it's a positive um, relationship here. And interestingly enough, we find in the, in the right corner here is um, Norwegian from Norway, Swedish from Sweden, from Swedish from Finland, we find German from Switzerland, Denmark, and so on. So it appears that when you use, um, you translate the word satisfied with a term that is more frequently used, it appears to be that you become more satisfied. But of course, this is the aggregate level, so it doesn't tell us the full picture. 
So if we try to do this more rigorously, what I've done here is uh, a multi-level regression model. Um, it is uh, individuals nested in countries, nested in languages. I have included socio-demographic variables as control, it's not included in the table though, uh, to control for, for potential differences there. And then I've added some, this is work in progress, so, but I added some of the most, uh, most uh, common explanations when you want to explain variation across countries when it comes to democratic satisfaction. And one is the Polity 4 measure about uh, going from democratic to autocratic regime. It's um, the age of the regime, democratic consolidation. It's uh, my, Søren Holmberg and Jonas Linde's contribution to this field. Also added some economy, GDP and GDP growth, unemployment. Also the effective number of parties uh, comes from a a seminal article by, by Jacques Thomasen, who shows that uh, more is not always less. Uh, and what we find here in the, in the first model here is that nothing is uh, significant, really. No stars. And uh, one explanation for this is often that uh, we don't have so many countries. And that is true. With, with more data, you always find significant results, of course. Interesting, though, is that in the second model, where I add this word intensity measure, which in itself is significant and on the intermediate level, things start to happen with the other explanations as well. More authoritarian states, less um, satisfaction. Um, consolidation of regime, yes, it works now, as do GDP growth and the effective number of parties. So hopefully this very simple measure can be one way forward to account for or improve accuracy and validation in already collected data. Last but not least, I'm going to show you some figures here that we often see from these country comparative surveys, and that is you try to rank countries, and you see the news media and so on. And this is just when we aggregate satisfaction. And even in this data set, we find Denmark in top, followed by Norway, Sweden in the fifth place. If we try to recalculate this and we use this word intensity measure to reweigh the data so we normalize it to zero for the English satisfied and then depending on if you translate it with the more intense or less intense terms we reweigh the data. What happens then is that we get a different ordering of countries where Denmark is no longer in top, Thailand is and if Thailand should be in a survey with satisfactory democracy that's another question but they're included. Sweden was on a fifth place, they are now down on number 12. So this apparently matters a lot. So the conclusions here would be that word intensity matters and uh, controlling for term intensity, I believe is one simple way to increase the validity in, in the estimations. And of course, with our APA, I, you can do this for whatever term you want. So this would be pretty much a little sum up of a very specific uh, research uh, paper I'm working on right now at the Mid-Sweden University. So thank you for this. Thank you. So are there any questions or remarks? Thank you, very interesting. I wonder, uh, when you are ge doing such a, a, a in, um, uh, what's it called, uh, survey. survey, thank you, survey, you are, someone is putting these words, satisfaction, happiness, and they interpret something in it. But what about if you ask, are you satisfied or, how do you have happiness? How do you feel about happiness? And then you have the person answering, uh, explaining what do you mean by happiness? Mm -hmm. Because that is very often done when you, when you see that if you can't actually uh, uh, act uh, according to what people say, if you don't really understand what do they actually mean. Mm -hmm. So what about that? Thank you. 
for this question, and that is exactly in the beginning here, when I showed you the, the satisfaction with democracy, I have put uh, satisfaction in italic and also the word democracy. And um, in a survey setting like this, I think it's the same goes for satisfaction, but what we've done here is we're focusing on more abstract terms or concepts like democracy, corruption, migration, and so on. And what we're doing there is to try to use the neighboring terms, classify them, and see how we can use this information to give us more information on what specific concept means in a specific country setting. So this is a big part, or perhaps the main part of this project, trying to capture, because the surveys need to be standardized so we can compare them. But we know that a concept like democracy means different things in different countries. But how can we possibly know what this is? In a survey setting, you can add a bunch of survey questions, but these survey questions are designed by a researcher who has his own conception of democracy. Our approach is to look for the language use in these countries and see how it's spoken about, and broadly, in that indirect way, get a better sense of what we actually are asking for and what it is we are comparing across countries. So, actually, we don't have time for any more questions. So, let's thank the speaker once more with a gift from Mid Sweden University. Thank you. Thank you.